I'm in the ancient city of Pompeii in Italy. You've probably heard of it. It's known around the world because a cataclysmic event here happened in AD 79 when Mount Vesuvius basically blew up and the people were sort of frozen in time. What happened was this uh, volcano, an active volcano, and I don't think the people were fully aware it was an active volcano uh, because it's such a pretty spot here, a great location, people wanted to live here. But uh, first there was a release of uh, uh, noxious gases that began to slowly kill the people and they were uh, asphyxiated. And then out of Mount Vesuvius came ash that effectively froze these people in time. And this was not known for, for centuries about what happened here. And someone discovered this place, I think it was around 250 years ago. It started into excavation as they were going down, they came to these large roundish objects and different shapes that seemed to be hollow inside. And they came to one and two and three and they went, what are these? And so someone had the idea of injecting it with cement to see what was in it. And what came out was a mold of, well, the people of Pompeii. Uh, there were people in motion, people crumbling, people protecting children, even animals and doors and other objects. So what you have is this amazing time capsule of what happened. So we might say, well, that's ancient history. Well, yeah, it is, but <laughs> it's interesting to look at some of the parallels of what can happen cataclysmically, how something can change overnight. And I wanna talk about that with you. What we can learn from the ancient city of Pompeii in our world today, and more specifically, in America today. The nation of Rome, once the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, forced other cultures into submission in Pax Romana. One of those cities that came under the control of Rome was Pompeii, where we are right now. You know, there's a lot of ways that a nation can come to an end. And every nation has a lifespan, a beginning, middle, and end. There was once the great nation of Babylon with no equal, but they were overtaken by the Medo-Persians. And they too were overtaken in time. And then there was Rome and Rome eventually was gone. Every nation is gonna to come to an end. Sometimes they're conquered by another nation. Sometimes they just fade into irrelevance. And sometimes something cataclysmic happens that causes a nation to no longer exist literally overnight. Sodom and Gomorrah comes to mind. God's judgment came upon those wicked people that celebrated their immorality. Other cities that Jesus mentioned, like Tyre and Sidon, no longer exist. And here we are in Pompeii a city that was thriving with activity and commerce and people just out and about doing what they were doing. And suddenly, Mount Vesuvius blows and their world as they knew it ended overnight. I look at our own nation, the United States of America. I think of the way that we started with our Judeo-Christian roots, our founding fathers with a strong belief in a creator, a God that gave us this freedom and how we honored him and acknowledged him. Not just any God, the God of the Bible. Listen, knowledge brings responsibility. And when you know it's right and you don't do it, it's worse than when you're in complete ignorance. And our nation has strayed so far from our roots. Today we celebrate pornography, not unlike Pompeii. We promote it, we export it around the world. We openly murder our children because they're an inconvenience. We just call them a blob of cells and it's called abortion, that's a technical term, but it's murdering an unborn child. We pretend as though God does not exist. Do we think that we can continue to thumb our nose at God and not face any consequences? Israel thought that, and if there's any nation that America parallels, it's the nation Israel, also founded on biblical principles established by God himself. God warned her over and over again that judgment would come if she did not repent of her sin and turn from her idolatry. And Israel just ignored God's warnings, ignored the prophets of God, and then one day the nation of Babylon overtook her. 
I know one thing for sure. There's going to come a day when the United States of America, the greatest superpower on the face of the earth, will no longer exist in the present form. Is that going to be because we're overtaken by another nation? Don't think it couldn't happen. Is it going to be because there's something cataclysmic that happens, like what took place here in Pompeii? Is it going to be for some other reason we just fade into irrelevance? I don't know. But one thing is clear. America needs God. America needs to turn back to God. America needs a spiritual revival. We don't want to end up like Pompeii. I do believe our best days could be ahead of us. And then again, some of our worst days could be ahead of us. In many ways, it's up to us. If we choose God, if we follow Him and His Word, our best days are ahead. If we disregard God and His Word, then we cannot be so proud to think that we too will not face a judgment, just like Pompey did years ago. interesting thing about the Jesus movement as reflected in LA is now the church is filled with young kids sitting everywhere and really on the heels of that I came for the first time when this thing was in full explosion mode getting notoriety it's on the news and one of the big things that everyone was attracted to were these baptisms it happened at a beach called Pirates Cove in Newport Beach in Corona del Mar. When I was baptized, I just sensed God's presence there. And it, it was like a magical moment. The whole thing, we didn't know we're living history. We're yeah. just getting baptized. We didn't know this is going to be on the cover of a magazine. It's going to be an iconic yeah. image. We just thought we're getting baptized. Yeah. But, but we were living in a little moment of time that was very special. And it was just sort of drenched in the Holy Spirit. I don't know how else to put it. There was this tangible sense of the presence of God. This revival was happening. And for the churches that opened the doors to it, they experienced revival. And to the churches that closed their door to it, they did not experience revival. You know, the first century church changed the world in a relatively short period of time. And so we kind of felt like we were living in a time like that. There's enough power here to go out and change the world. And we pray that this will be the beginning of a spiritual awakening that will sweep the world. Hello. <laughs> and that, that is our prayer, that God will send another spiritual awakening to the United States. How many of you think that needs to happen again? Raise your hand up. I'll tell you what. <laughs> What's it going to take to wake our country up? Another terrorist attack, it appears, is now taking place in Orlando, Florida. Upward of 50 people were killed and as many as 50 more have been wounded. And if this is a terrorist attack, and it appears that it will turn out that way, this will be the worst attack on American soil since 9-11. And you know, we look to our law enforcement agencies, we look to the military, we look to first responders. There's only so much these people can do. Here's what we need to be looking to. We need to pray for all of them, and we need to pray for our country that America wakes up and turns to God because we need him like never before. So that's what I want to talk about on my message. I'm calling it Revival in Our Time, Part 2. And my text is Jonah Chapter 2. Turn there with me if you would. Jonah 2. And my message is Revival in Our Time. Or rather, can we have Revival in Our Time? I want to look at one of the largest revivals in human history. And this gives me hope for our own country because this nation we're going to examine together deserved judgment. And in a way, I feel as though our country deserves judgment. And you say, but Greg, why? Because knowledge brings responsibility. And as I mentioned in that video there in Pompeii, the only other nation we would 
be closely likened to would be the nation Israel, a nation also founded on biblical principles. That is how we started this country, and that knowledge brings responsibility. I think of the words of Thomas Jefferson, who said, quote, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. But we're gonna look at the story of a nation that had a revival, just like America needs to have a revival. The name of this city is Nineveh. But let me make a distinction between the word revival and awakening. We often use them interchangeably, but I think a distinction can be made. America needs an awakening. The church needs a revival. An awakening is when a nation comes alive spiritually and sees its need for God and turns to God. A revival is when God's people come back to life again. That brings me to point number one. What is revival? We need to take the, the mysticism out of the word and just see it for what it is. It, it simply means to bring back to life, to restore. To be revived is to wake up from a state of sleep. I have a C.S. Lewis who said, quote, a moderately bad man knows he's not very good. A thoroughly bad man thinks he's all right. You understand sleep when you are awake, not when you're sleeping. So in other words, if you think you're a great person with no problems, then you're really more asleep than you realize. Now, uh, sometimes I'll watch television with my wife and she'll select something that to me is, well, how shall I put it delicately? Boring. And um, we just have different tastes in general. So I'll watch whatever it is she's watching and, and I'll sometimes doze off and she'll say, Greg, you fell asleep and I'll, I'll wake up to nine. And why do I do that? It's not a sin to sleep, not to take a little nap, but especially if something is boring, but that's the way we are. We don't want to admit we're asleep. We don't think we're asleep, but the person that is asleep doesn't necessarily know they're asleep. It's when you're awake that you can say, oh wow, I was asleep. That's what revival is. It's coming back. It's waking up. This is the kind of faith that God wants us to have. We need the faith of the Christians of the first century. The faith that changed the world. The faith that turned the world upside down. Consider this. Everywhere the Apostle Paul went, there was either a riot or a revival, but there was always action. It never got boring. And G. Campbell Morgan once said, and I quote, organized Christianity that fails to make a disturbance is dead. That doesn't mean being obnoxious or just creating a scene. Making a disturbance means getting some reaction to your faith. I feel the time has come for the church to start making a disturbance again. Revival is when God gets so sick and tired of being misrepresented, he shows up himself. And that's what we need to pray for right now, that that will happen. So number one, revival is waking up from sleep. Point number two, biblical preaching can bring revival. Biblical preaching can bring revival. And that's illustrated in the story that we're going to look at in a moment. The story of the prophet Jonah. The reluctant prophet. The chicken of the sea, you might say. The original chicken of the sea. He did not want to go and preach to the city of Nineveh. But because he finally went with a little extra persuasion, it resulted in the largest spiritual awakening in all of the Bible. God said, go. Jonah said, no. God said, oh. God will always have the last word. Now, why did Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? Because Jonah was, well, a patriotic Israelite. And the enemies of Israel were the Assyrians, uh, and their capital was Nineveh. And so when God said to Jonah, go preach to Nineveh, he thought this through, and he thought, I know your nature, Lord. I know how gracious you are and loving you are and how willing you are to pardon. And my fear is if I go and preach to those creepy people, you'll forgive them and not judge them. But if I don't preach, Jonah deduced, then God will judge them and that will be one less enemy we have to deal with. So he did not want to go. And it is true, uh, the Ninevites were really cruel people. Uh, they were known for their savagery. In fact, when the Ninevites would conquer a nation, they would often torture the people they conquered before they executed 
them. They were known to burn boys and girls alive and do torture others, tearing the skin from their bodies and leaving them to die in the scorching sun. And rather than hide this depravity, they celebrated it and proclaimed it. They even built monuments to their own cruelty. It reminds us a little bit of the Nazis during World War II or in present day terms, reminds us a lot of ISIS. The size of Nineveh was around one million. That was a very big city for ancient times that would be about the size of San Francisco. They were the capital of mighty Assyria, which was the superpower of the day. It required three days to circle metropolitan Nineveh. And those Ninevites, man, they lived large. They enjoyed the best chariots, the finest food, the most exotic entertainment, and they had an extensive business and commercial system like none in all of the world. And in addition, they had been ruling now for 200 years, and they were the reigning superpower on the planet at this time. But unbeknownst to them, their days were numbered. It would not be all that long until Babylon would come and come or oh, overtake her. So God was giving to Nineveh one last chance. And I wonder, is God trying to speak to America right now? Is he saying to America, you need to wake up and you need to turn back to me? Listen, if God could use someone like Jonah to bring about a revival, certainly he could use someone like you or me. One person put it this way, if God could bring a mighty revival in Nineveh with no better representative than Jonah and no more gospel than he preached in their streets, he can surely do the same for America, end quote. Very true. So God says to Jonah, go preach to Nineveh. Jonah's response was, Lord, no way. They drink haterade in Nineveh. These people are wicked. I don't want to go to them. And truly, as I said, they were wicked because God said they effectively stink to high heaven. So Jonah, you know the story, got in a boat and went the opposite direction and a great storm came and all the sailors on the boat began to cry out to their gods for help. By the way, that must have been a bad storm because most people I know that have their sea legs are pretty common storms, but this was a really scary one. So they're crying out to their various deities, hoping one of them has the right one. And they think about this mysterious stranger below deck. And they bring him up. Of course, that's Jonah. They ask him what the story is. He goes, well, this storm is here because of me. And I'm a Hebrew and I'm running from God. And he told me to go preach to Nineveh. And I said, no. They're looking at him and thinking, uh, so why would you run from a God this powerful? Then Jonah says, listen, if you throw me over the side of the boat, the storm will stop. They're like, really? Okay, bye. <laughs> over the side he goes. Now the Lord brings a great fish to swallow Jonah. And by the way, the Bible never says Jonah was swallowed by a whale. I don't know why we always say that. Sort of like when we say Adam and Eve ate the apple. The Bible never says they ate an apple. It says they ate forbidden fruit. The Bible never says a whale swallowed Jonah. Now maybe a whale did, but the Bible specifically says a great fish, and a literal translation would be a sea monster. So maybe it was a custom designed fish just for Jonah. Multiple rooms, you know, I don't know. Maybe it was a beast that is now extinct. Maybe it was a whale. It's certainly possible, but it really doesn't matter. People fixate on the story of Jonah and the whale, and they miss the bigger story of the greatest revival in ancient history. Well, you know the rest of the story. He's swallowed, and inside, I have to say, Jonah was stubborn. He spent three days and three nights inside of that stomach and said, I ain't budging. Wrapped in seaweed, humidity like you can't believe, fish smacking him in the face. I'm not budging. Finally, he came to his senses, and Jonah had a personal revival in the belly of the fish. And we read about that in Jonah 2, verse 1. Then Jonah, then, when? After three days and three nights. Then he prayed to the Lord as God from inside the fish, which reminds you, you can pray pretty much anywhere. If you can pray from the inside of a fish, you can pray anywhere else. He said, I cried to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the world of the dead, Lord, and you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Drop down to verse 7. When I had lost all hope, 
I turned my thoughts once more to the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all of God's mercies, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. Inside the belly of the beast, Jonah had revival, meaning he was revived and brought back to life and what God had called him to do. So now that he had hope again, as he turned his thoughts to the Lord, he was ready to go obey the Lord. We often make the topic of revival way too mysterious. It's really quite simple. Ari Tori, an excellent writer, who among other things has written on the topic of prayer, put it this way. He said he had a prescription for revival. Tori said if a church or a person followed it, they would be revived. There's three things Tori said they should do. Number one, he said, let a few Christians, they don't even have to be many, get thoroughly right with God. If this is not done, the rest will come to nothing. A few Christians, not a lot, get thoroughly right with God. Number two, Tori says, let them commit themselves to pray for revival until God opens the windows of heaven and it comes down. And number three, let them put themselves at the disposal of God for his use as he sees fit in winning others to Christ. That is all. Tori says, I've given this prescription around the world and in no instant has it failed. It cannot fail. So now Jonah is revived and he's ready to do what God has called him to do. And so the fish cruises up to the beach at Nineveh and barfs out Jonah. So Jonah was righteous and ralphed. <laughs> and he was revived and recommissioned by God. Listen to this. First God sent revival to Jonah. Then Jonah brought revival to Nineveh. That's because nothing can happen through you until it first happens to you. It has to start with you. You know, you're saying, I want to raise my children in the way of the Lord. Great, do that. But make sure you're walking in the way of the Lord. Because some things are caught and other things are taught. Yeah, they'll listen to your bedtime stories and they'll listen to your little mini sermons, but they're also going to be watching your life to see if mom or dad live that out. Sure, we can go out into our workplace and tell people that work with us about Jesus Christ. Make sure you're a model of what it is to follow Christ. It can't happen through you until it has first happened to you. That brings us to Jonah chapter 3. Let's find out what happened. So he shows up in Nineveh and here's his message. Look at verse 4. One day, one day Jonah entered the city and shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now in Nineveh will be destroyed. Well, that's not a very hopeful message, is it? No promise of forgiveness. No way out. Basically, you're all going to die. Now, that message surely wouldn't make a difference, but look what happens. Verse 5, the people of Nineveh believe God's message from the greatest to the least, and they decided to go without food and wear sackcloth to show their sorrow. And when the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes and dressed himself in sackcloth and sat on a heap of ashes. And the king and the nobles sent this decree to the city. No one, not even the animals, may eat or drink anything at all. So they were fasting. Everyone is required to wear sackcloth and pray earnestly to God. Everyone must turn from their evil ways and stop all of their violence. Who can tell? Maybe God will have pity on us and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. And when God saw they put a stop to their evil ways, he had mercy on them and didn't carry out the destruction he had threatened. We'll stop there. Is that not an amazing story? What a stunning awakening. An entire city turned to God. They even turned from the specific sin of violence that they were known for. God spared them and sent a spiritual awakening. And after a sermon like this, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. But actually it's more hopeful than you may think. Because by the very fact that he was telling them they had 40 days offered a measure of hope. 40 days until it happens. 40 days for you to get right with God. 40 days for you to wake up to what is happening around you. You see, when God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, 
There was no warning. 40 days and Sodom and Gomorrah will be destroyed. It just happened. But in this case, God gave a warning just as I believe he's giving warnings to our country right now. But if a city as wicked as Nineveh could turn, certainly our country can turn. That brings me to point number four. A revived person will be an evangelistic person. A revived person will be an evangelistic person. Let me turn that around. If you have no desire to share your faith, you need personal revival. Why is a revived person an evangelistic person? Because their evangelism is a result of a Christ-filled life. You want to know an interesting uh, statistic. Most people that come to Christ do it because someone who was young in the faith shared with them. 80 to 90 percent of people who have the gospel shared with them are from people who have known the Lord for two years or less. Did you hear that? 80 to 90 percent of people who have the gospel shared with them are from people who have known the Lord for two years or less. Isn't that interesting? Why is that? Why is it not from 10 years or more? The reason it's from two years or less is these are people who are often still in what we would call the first love relationship with Jesus Christ. They're still discovering what God has done for them. They're still excited about it. But as we get older in the faith and we walk with the Lord for a time, sometimes we start taking these things for granted. You know what that means? It means we need revival. We need to be brought back to the place where we once were, where we realize how important it is to share with others what Jesus has done for us. Listen, you want to experience revival in your life? Get a brand new believer next to you and hang out with them. See, here's the problem. If you hang around with a bunch of jaded Christians, some who have even become cynical, and after church you critique the sermon, you need some new friends. Hang out with some new believers who are hearing this stuff for the first time and are fired up and they have questions that will get you digging back into scripture again. It's the best thing you can do for your own spiritual health. You stabilize them and they re-energize you. Everybody benefits. But you see, sometimes we get away from that and we need to have a revival. Now that brings me to my last point, number four. And that is that if you are, actually that is not my last point, um, My last point is number five. Sorry. I already did number four, which means even preachers make mistakes. That's my point. Write that down. My last point is even revived people need to be revived again. Even revived people need to be revived again. Why do I say this? Well, here's this awesome spiritual awakening. Thousands of people are believing. God is not judging them. How does Jonah react? Is he dancing in the streets, doing a little happy dance? No. He's angry. He's upset. In fact, he's hopping mad. Look at Jonah 4, verse 1. This change of plans upset Jonah, and he became very angry and complained to the Lord about it, saying, didn't I say before I left home you would do this, Lord? This is why I ran away to Tarshish. I know you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. I knew how easily you could cancel your plans for destroying these people. So just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive because nothing I predicted is going to happen. What a brat. (laughs) But look at how the Lord reacts. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? You see, Jonah is just having a pity party. I wanted to see destruction. In fact, he was so excited, he pulled up a ringside seat to watch it. He had his popcorn and his milk duds, and it was going to be great. He's going to put it up on Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook and everything else. And nothing happened. Judgment didn't come. So he's angry. He's playing Angry Birds. He was so angry. The Lord is like, what is wrong with you, son? I spared these people. You should be rejoicing. You should not be upset. See, the problem with Jonah is he was preoccupied with himself. Here's a man who survived three days and three nights in a fish's stomach. A man who repents and prays and preaches the truth of the people of Nineveh. A man that God uses to help bring about a spiritual awakening. And yet this guy falls into sin. 
It's a good reminder, no matter how long you've known the Lord, you can still mess up. No matter how long you've known the Lord, you still may need to be revived again. You know, sometimes people worry about new believers not changing quickly enough. I'm more concerned with old converts who have stopped changing altogether. Let me say that again. You worry about new believers, they're not changing quickly enough. I'm more worried about older believers who have stopped changing. So we go to that new Christian and say, oh man, they're rough around the edges and they haven't got all the verbiage right yet. And okay, well give them time, be patient. You know, they'll get it. But I'm more concerned about older believers that stop changing. They've just settled in their ways. Maybe they've traded in their old vices like immorality and drugs and drinking and profanity and, and replaced them with new vices like pride, backbiting, gossip, or even bitterness. See, Jonah was an older saint who knew better and he was having a relapse and he was angry with God. Are you angry with God? I mean, be honest. Someone might be. You might say, well, you know, I, I was hoping this would happen in my life and it didn't happen. And I prayed this prayer and God didn't answer the prayer I wanted him to answer in the way that I wanted him to answer it. And he blessed somebody else over here and I think I'm more deserving of that blessing and, and I'm mad at God. Well, you need to let that go because Jonah missed the whole picture. Now, interestingly, while he's sitting there waiting for Nineveh to be judged, the Bible says the Lord caused a gourd to grow next to him. Now, that's King James gourd. It was sort of like almost a palm tree uh, with a leafy top that would give him shade. So he's under his little gourd, you know, waiting for the judgment. And then the Bible says the Lord brought a worm and ate the gourd. That must have been one big gnarly worm, you know? It's funny, in the book of Jonah, we talk about Jonah and the whale. No one ever talks about Jonah and the worm. That was a sizable worm who ate it, and now Jonah is literally out of his gourd <laughs> in more ways than one. And he's more upset with losing his shade than he is with the fact that God did not give these people a chance. And so here he is wanting comfort more than the will of God. This reminds me a little bit of the story of the prodigal sons. Remember Jesus told that story? And uh, we often see the prodigal son, but there was more than one. One prodigal stayed home, the other prodigal ran away. One prodigal went out and consorted with prostitutes and drugged the family name to the gutter and, and lost all of his money. And the other son never left home but he was filled with anger. And you know, it's interesting because Jesus told this story to illustrate the fact that he was being criticized for sharing his love with sinners and ignoring the religious people. So what he's really saying to the Pharisees is, hey, check out the story and guess who you are in the story. The sinners are like the prodigal who came to his senses and returned home and the older brother, well, that's like you. Remember how the story went? The boy finally comes home after he's wasted all of his money and the father runs to greet him and throws a big barbecue. But a lot of times we don't finish the story. It goes on, Luke 15, and this is a modern translation. The older brother stalked off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. And his father came out and tried to talk to him, but the boy would not listen. The son said, look how many years I've stayed here serving you, never giving you one moment of grief, and you've never thrown a party like that for me and my friends. But this son of yours, who's thrown away your money on whores, shows up and you go all out with a feast. The father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time and everything I have is yours, but this is a wonderful time and a time to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost, he is found. This brother of yours, you don't even care about him. Do we even care about people that don't know the Lord? Do we care about people who knew the Lord but have stumbled? We should. Because we're told over in Galatians 6, Brothers, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back to the right path and be careful to not fall into the same temptation yourself. Back to Jonah. God spared thousands of lives and Jonah missed his shade. He missed his comfort. And God is trying to wake him up to the reality of what he is facing. You know, I think we all have a Nineveh we are in effect called to. Some place where we leave our comfort zone. 
some place where we admit our need, some place where we reach out to someone we would not normally reach out to, and we need to be obedient to the Lord. Here's something I find very interesting. Jonah wrote the book of Jonah. Now if I was Jonah, I would have not written Jonah chapter four. It would have had three chapters. It would have told the story of a man who runs from God, a man who comes to his senses, a man who does what God wants, and then a man who plays a role in revival. But Jonah wrote Jonah four and told all about his selfishness and his sulking. And Jonah even gave God the last word in Jonah four, verse 10. The Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant. You did nothing to put it there, and the plan is only at best short-lived. But Nineveh, with more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals, shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? You see, that's the truth. God wants us to see our need and to act on it. What is revival? Revival is getting back to the Christian life as it was meant to be lived. Revival is being in the bloom of first love for a lifetime, walking closely with the Lord. No, you can't always have those initial emotions you had as a new convert any more than you can have butterflies in your stomach like when you first met your husband or wife-to-be. If I still felt the same way toward my wife as I felt when I first met her, and I told her, I have a lightness, my head feels a little dizzy, she'd think I was having a heart attack or something. That's not realistic, but your love can grow deeper. Your love can grow stronger. And that's how we ought to be as followers of Jesus. Revival is nothing more or less than a new obedience to God. And then it's long obedience in the same direction. Listen, only God can send an awakening to America. But revival can happen right here, right now. What do I need to do? Well, remember 2 Chronicles 7, 14 said, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then God says, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. That can happen for you now. The people of Nineveh repented of their sin. They called it what it was. God sent his healing. And God can do the same for you. We need to get back to that again. Now I wonder right now if the Lord has spoken to your heart. And I wonder if you feel as though you need to have a spiritual revival. I wonder if you who have been revived need to be revived again. You're saying, I don't care about lost people. I don't have a passion for the word of God like I once had. I don't really care that much about prayer. But I want to be revived. I want to get back to that place where God wants me to be. Or maybe the Lord has spoken to you and there are some wicked things you need to turn from. Listen, if you want to do it, I'm going to give you a chance to do it, but I'm not going to make it easy. I'm going to ask you to leave your comfort zone right now. Listen to what I'm saying to you. If you want God to send revival in your life, if you would be honest enough to admit you need to be refreshed again by God and need to turn from some sin, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, walk down here in front of the platform, and I want you to kneel in front of this platform. I want you to get up and come down here and kneel. And if there's no room at the front, you kneel in the aisle. Just get up and come. You say, but Greg, why do I need to kneel? Because God says we should come and humble ourselves. And I'm going to kneel with you. So you get up and come, you that want to be revived by God. You that have had the Lord speak to you, get up out of your seat and come down here. Stand here and kneel and we're all gonna pray together. You that are watching this screen, I want you to do the same thing wherever you are. Get up, walk forward, right in front of the stage there and you get down on your knees and we're gonna pray and we're gonna ask God to send revival to all of us. Don't do it if you don't mean it. But here's your opportunity. Come on down. Repent. Be revived. For every need to bow down, for every heart to believe, for every voice to cry out, burn like a fire in me. For 
My people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, the Lord says, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's personalize it. Take out my people, put in your name. If John, Josh, Mary, Susan, Kathy, insert name here will turn from her or his wicked ways and pray and seek my face. Thou hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their marriage. Heal their life. What's broken? God can heal it. But we have to come and say, God, I need your help. They'll sing this chorus through one last time. Anyone that has had the Lord speak to them. This is not a call to salvation today, folks. We do that every week. This is a call to repentance. This is a call to revival. If there's anybody else that needs to come, you come and then we're gonna pray together. Listen, I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer. And, and as we kneel before the Lord, humbling ourselves, you pray this prayer out loud after me. Mean it from your heart. And I believe it's a prayer that God will hear and definitely a prayer that God will answer. Pray this after me now. Lord Jesus, I need revival. I need to wake up. I need to be refreshed. I want to be passionate for you. I want to be on fire for you. I want a greater hunger for the Word of God, a greater desire to pray, a stronger burden for non-believers. Lord, revive me. Refresh me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit right now. I receive it from you now. Oh Lord, you've heard their prayer. You've heard our prayer. As the psalmist says, will you not revive us that your people may rejoice in you? Lord, we ask for that revival in our lives. It starts with us as individuals. It starts with us as a church. And then when revival happens to Christians, awakening happens in America. So Lord, revive us. 
You've heard our prayer. Now let us take practical steps to do what honors you each and every day. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's all stand up. God bless all of you that prayed that prayer. Going back to what R.A. Torrey said about how to have a personal revival. I think of what we just did. Remember what he said? Let a few Christians, they don't have to be a lot, get thoroughly right with God. Let them commit themselves to pray for revival until God opens the windows of heaven. And then let them put themselves at the disposal of God for his use as he sees fit in winning others to Christ. Will you do that now? You put yourself at the disposal of God. Say, all right, Lord, I'll do it. See, I think sometimes we're waiting for a big emotional thing. I felt revival. <laughs> Forget that stuff. Who cares what you felt or didn't feel? Maybe it's just a pizza from last night. <laughs> revival is just a new beginning of obedience to God, and then it's long obedience in the same direction. It's not rocket science. It's knowing what is right and doing it. And I pray that you are refreshed and revived and you go out and impact those that are around you. The prayer we've prayed in this service, all of you that have joined us, could change a lot of people. So let it start here. And God bless each and every one of you.